Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Listen now for God's word to you. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. And which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Though the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, the word of our Lord endures forever. Well, today we visit Big Bend National Park, which lies on the U.S.-Mexico border and the Chisos Mountains in the Chihuahuan Desert. I'm going to put our sticker on the map. And is up here. Here is Big Bend all the way down here. Now, when I said it was on the U.S.-Mexico border in the Chisos Mountains in the Chihuahua Desert, you probably asked yourself, where in the world is that? Of all the parks that we're visiting this summer, all but one were nominated by each of you. Big Bend was nominated by me. I'm not sure if anyone else of you have been there, but I chose it because I feel that we have a lot to learn from Big Bend National Park, which is virtually in the middle of nowhere still. It is four and a half hours southeast of El Paso, eight hours south of Amarillo, and seven hours due west of San Antonio, Texas. Big Bend encompasses the entirety of the Chisos mountain range and runs along the Rio Grande River. The park is in fact shared with Mexico because on either side are protected lands, Big Bend on the U.S. side and Ocampo protected area on the Mexican side. Big Bend is a unique place where borders and boundaries are routinely crossed and nature has its say. 
When I visited Big Bend National Park with my brother Elliot in 2011, we learned so much about borders and boundaries, both human-made and nature-made. At the time we visited, I was living in San Antonio. This was May 2011, and that was just one month before I had my first interview with a certain Presbyterian church in Haddon Heights, New Jersey. But at that time, in May 2011, my brother Elliot flew from his home in Pittsburgh to see me in San Antonio, and we drove the seven long, lonely hours to Big Bend on highway so flat and desolate and straight that the speed limit was 80 miles an hour. But as we approached the park, the desert landscape jutted up into mountains. You know, some might say that Big Bend is a barren wasteland, but we marveled at the mountains and canyons and cacti and birds. Here's a picture that my brother took at sunset right outside our park lodge. The next morning, Elliot and I were up early to hike along the Rio Grande River, trying to explore the area before the temperature spiked to 106 degrees, which it did later that day. The trail we took wound its way down to the Rio Grande, the river that forms the entire border between Texas and Mexico. I had never been to the Rio Grande River, so I was expecting an actual grand river. The Rio Grande River may be the 20th longest river in the world, but it was the narrowest river I've ever seen. In fact, it was smaller than a creek. It was more like a stream. We stood there in disbelief. It was narrower than this sanctuary is, probably in from where the pews are just a little bit. As we looked at it, we thought, how could this little stream define the border between two nations? How could this little wisp of water separate two nations and two peoples and cause so much strife and debate. But there it was. My brother, who is more of an explorer than I, wanted to go across. So he waded in. Here is a picture of Elliot in the Rio Grande, and you can see just how wide and how deep this Grand River really is not. So Elliot made his way over there, and we were talking back and forth across the river because it was not very far. And I took some pictures with my camera and then all of his cameras. You see, Elliot is a professional photographer, and he had carried a lot of his equipment into the canyon and then left it with me on the U.S. side of the river a decision that he regretted as soon as he got over to the Mexican side. I want to take a picture from this side, he called across to me. So come over here and get it, I said in my best annoyed sister voice. And that's when it started. There we were, siblings on either side of the U.S.-Mexico border, arguing. He didn't want to come back over. And I wasn't going over there. So we were in a stalemate. He pulled out his best little brother double dog dare. Throw your camera over to me, he yelled. I'm not throwing my camera over, I said. I'll throw yours over. To which he replied, you better not throw my camera over. My camera costs thousands of dollars and yours only costs a hundred. I mean, that was a fair point, but that's still a hundred dollars that I prefer not to spend on replacing a camera that I willfully threw into the Rio Grande River. So I said, no way. And that's when he pulled out the triple dog dare. There we were, 
grown adults, each in a different country. And my brother says, what are you, chicken? Yeah. Here's him doing the chicken dance on the other side of the river. Now friends, I'm here to tell you three things. One, I'm no chicken. Two, no one in the world besides my brother could egg me on enough to do something so ridiculous. And three, I didn't play softball for all those years for no reason. I threw the camera. Here are Elliot's pictures from the Mexican side of the Rio Grande River. Still have that camera, by the way. It made it safely back. And Elliot and I still laugh about that, of course. I wonder, though, how many arguments have taken place over that border? Ours was completely silly with very little to lose. But there are real arguments over that border every day, every hour, every minute. Arguments with real consequence that affect real people's lives. In fact, two wars have been fought to make the Rio Grande, the U.S.-Mexican border, in the first place, the Texas War of Independence and the Mexican-American War. And today, lives are lost daily on that border. Disputes break out. Arrests are made. The, the border debate represents humanity's deepest felt emotions. Safety and welcome, law and order, mercy and compassion, nations and treaties, opened and closed. I think this is why Big Ben captured my heart so much. It's a place where nature trans transcends the borders that we humans create. The thin, shallow river itself is no barrier between two countries. The river is so small that it practically invites people to cross over to the other side. Visitors to the U.S. side can easily walk or throw things or have a conversation across it. Artisans on the Mexican side regularly cross over to sell their wares along the trails on the U.S. side. In Big Bend, nature, the natural world, shapes the way that people live in the world. Just outside the park, Homeland Security patrol and stop all entering persons at checkpoints. But inside the park, there's a place of respite and refuge and reciprocity. It's an adventurous border. Our gospel lesson for this morning is also about an adventurer at a border. The parable of the Good Samaritan is one we know so well, almost by heart. We refer to Samaritans in our day as helpers and do-gooders and people who do small acts of kindness for strangers. But the parable of the Good Samaritan isn't just about how to show kindness to strangers. The Good Samaritan is about boundary crossings. The Good Samaritan is about borders. One thing that Jesus' first century audience knows completely when they hear this story that is lost in our first 21st century ears is that Samaritans and Jews were from different countries and they were not legally allowed to interact with each other. They were legally prohibited from sharing things in common or even touching each other. In the parable, there are two real borders drawn. 
borders between the lands of Judea and Samaria, borders between the peoples of Jews and Samaritans. A number of years ago, when a few of us took a pilgrimage to Israel, Palestine, we were on that road that goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when we were on that road, our tour guide reminded us that the parable, if Jesus had told that parable today, it would have been about an Israeli helped by a Palestinian. So that means if the parable were told in Texas today, it would be about an American helped by a Mexican immigrant. It might go something like this. A man was going down from El Paso to Big Bend when he fell in among robbers who beat him and stripped him and left him half dead. Now by chance, an ICE officer was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, an immigration lawyer, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Mexican immigrant, while traveling, came near. And when he saw him, he was moved to pity. He bandaged his wounds, put him in his own car, and brought him to the nearest town, where he paid for him to be taken care of and to stay. Which of these was a neighbor to the man on the border, Jesus asks. And we reply with the lawyer, the one who showed him mercy. So go and do likewise, Jesus tells us. Go and do likewise. The Good Samaritan is about transcending laws and borders and boundaries. It's about transcending the laws and borders and boundaries that humans put between themselves. The priest and the judge should be the people who help. Because they follow the laws of the land. But the Samaritan, the foreigner, the outsider is the one who helps because he follows the laws of the heart. He follows the law of God. This parable is a story about what it means to love our neighbor. And in it, Jesus says that loving our neighbor is following the laws of mercy and compassion, no matter who and no matter where. Jesus says that loving our neighbor knows no bounds. Loving our neighbor knows no borders. Loving our neighbor only knows mercy. Friends, we might not live in a place where a literal, literal border is at our door. But we sure do draw borders and boundaries and put up walls between ourselves. We put those up between the people of our own lives, between the people who are different from us, between the people who believe something different from us, between people in our own communities, between people in the community next door. We continue to draw lines between each other. So this week I want you to think about borders and boundaries in your life. What borders and boundaries do you need to cross in your life in the name of compassion and mercy? As we meditate on how God is calling you into this space, let us listen to some beautiful music as we look at pictures of Big Bend National Park, all which were taken by Elliot Kramer. Let us come before God.
Let us pray. God of mercy and compassion, break down the borders and boundaries and walls that divide us. Help us to cross these boundaries so that we might show your love and mercy and compassion to all of your people. Help us to be good neighbors. Walk with us as we do this difficult work.